Um, so welcome to this webinar about clearing rights in collection items, um, where we are very happy to have Naomi Korn with us. Um, and for those that were on the first webinar of this series, um, so it's, uh, it's again uh, Masha and me that will be walking through the, um, the webinar. And so um, remember that this, is, uh, this webinar about rights clearance is one of the four maybe five webinars in a longer series um, about copyright when sharing data with Europeana, which is designed primarily for those of you that are actually sharing data with Europeana, but others might also, others that are not involved in that process might also find these webinars interesting. So you're very welcome to be here as well. Um, so today we're going to talk about mainly rights clearance, the step that goes uh, before you start sharing the data with Europeana. Um, and the webinars that will follow this one, uh, just as a reminder, are uh, a webinar about opening collections up. And we're very happy to have Andrew Wallace, Evelyn Heidel, and Karen Glassman as speakers. And then a webinar about the copyright directive that will be led by Paul Keller. Um, the dates are on this slide, but you will also find more information on how to register on the page on Europeana Pro, where you found information about uh, this very same webinar. Um, and just before um, we get started, uh, for those that were not at the last webinar, which was the opening webinar of this series, we talked about, um, the first webinar was more to set the context. So we talked about the principles that guide copyright when sharing data with Europeana. Uh, so for instance, how we treat the public domain. Uh, we talked about standardized rights information like Creative Commons licenses, tools, and rights statements which we ask you to use when you share data with Europeana. We then talked about how to correctly choose these pieces of information, also noting the possible different layers of rights that there might be in one work in a digital object. And then finally, we worked with a couple of examples that helped us illustrate uh, the principles that we had been presenting. Um, and you will, if you registered, you should have received the recording. If not, it's also available online on the webpage uh, that it talks about the webinars. And so over to Masha. Yeah, thanks, Ariadna, for this intro. So I'm just quickly going to go through the few housekeeping items. Um, so you probably noticed that your audios and videos are muted. So if you would like to say something about yourself, um, you can um, uh, type a short introduction in the chat. And if you have any questions for us, please use the Q&A box. We will dedicate time to answer your questions at the end of the webinar. And if you wish, you can also upvote the questions so that we know which ones are the most valuable to you. Uh, we are recording this webinar. And as Ariadna mentioned, we will share the recording with you after the webinar. Um, and now I would just like to do a very quick introduction uh, from my side. Um, I worked as a data ingestion specialist at Europeana, and we are noticing that more and more cultural heritage institutions are trying to find new ways how to showcase their online collections. Um, so they're exploring um, new ways how to create online galleries and exhibitions. They are also using their digital objects for blog posts, for stories, for videos. They are contributing their collections to platforms such as Europeana, Google Arts, and so on. And managing copyright is at the heart of all these activities. Uh, we feel that only by managing copyright effectively, institutions can confidently distribute their collections online and participate in the online culture. And I'm very happy that we have Naomi with us today. And I know that she's working with lots of um, cultural heritage institutions in the UK. And um, I'm very excited to hear her speak about her experience. And she will also share some practical tips with us. Um, before you embark on the journey of clearing rights, there are just a few things that I would like to mention. Um, it's really useful if you think about your goals as an institution. Um, so evaluate your needs and think about what you wish to do with your digital collections. 
Uh, do you want to share images on social media platforms? Are you planning on sharing digitized collections with platforms such as your piano? Um, we think it's really good if you have clarity about common uses that you wish to make um, so that you know uh, which permissions you're going to have to ask for when it comes to clearing copyright. Uh, it's also really useful if you have the time and resources to analyze your situation, if you can devote some time to rights research to actually discover which rights you have and um, which rights you don't have. And of course, we are well aware that not all institutions are employing copyright experts. So please don't be afraid to ask questions. Uh, you can turn to experts outside of your institutions to help you think through some rights protection issues. Uh, we offer some copyright information on European Pro sites, but you can um, always get in touch with us. We will share our contact details at the end of this webinar. And yeah, don't be scared to ask questions. Copyright can be a very difficult thing and also very complicated. And um, yeah, that's a little introduction from me and I'll pass it on to you, Naomi. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Masha. Thank you so much, Ariadna, and welcome everyone. Um, I should say thank you very much indeed for um, inviting me to talk with you. I'm going to um, just grab my um, presentation and then we can make a start. That's great. Can I check that uh, Masha, you and Ariadna can see my presentation okay? Yes. Super. Okay, so um, I'm the Managing Director of a small UK-based consultancy company called Nemicorn Associates. And we have been supporting cultural heritage organisations in the UK and also um, further afield with copyright and also data protection within the context of what they do. So I'm going to talk to you um, from the basis of our um, long history of experience. Um, I also should put my hand up to say that um, my own background is um, as an assistant curator of prehistoric archaeology. My first career was as uh, an archaeologist. So my whole journey has been, um, my professional journey has been through museums. And so I work very, very closely indeed with um, a lot of uh, UK based organisations wanting to get the collections online. But I'll talk more about that as we go through. Um, so I'm going to be looking today at um, key points relating to getting your collections online. And also starting to introduce you to um, best practices. So we always, as a matter of course, before we even start presenting, explain to our delegates how they can use our presentation. And I'm thrilled to tell you that this presentation is available under a Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike license. It will be made available uh, to you as um, a recorded video, and I'll also be sending through a PDF to Masha and Ariadna at uh, Europeana, so you can gain access to what I say afterwards. Um, this is my team, um, but there are more of us. We've got about 25 consultants, um, and I know a couple are joining us today on our webinar who specialize in um, copyright, other types of IP and data privacy. I should say that um, we are a business, but we work as a social enterprise. And particularly during the COVID crisis, we have put a lot of effort into trying to do whatever we can to support our sector. And this means that we've created a lot of free resources to help navigate the complex journey through information law compliance. They are all available on our website under a Creative Commons license. And Europeana, as well as ICOM UK and a number of other organisations are partners that we've worked with giving our time for free to develop these webinars so that you can also come on them for free. And we're very passionate, particularly now, in doing whatever we can to support our sector. Now, you can find out everything you want about us on our website. If you go to uh, nemicorn.com and then into the resources section, that's where you'll find loads of stuff. And I promise you that there'll be more and more things added to that resource section as we go through. I'm certainly very happy for Europeana. Um, if you want to grab any of that and host that as well as the license allows you to do, um, just so that we can get the messages out there about copper and Masha, as you say, try and deal with some of that complexity. Um, these are just a snapshot of some of the great and good organisations that we have the absolute joy and privilege to either support right now or to have supported in the past. Um, lots and lots of cultural heritage organisations. Um, I know that uh, some of you are representing some of the organisations that we have supported over the years. Um, but we have also worked with um, not just museums and galleries, but libraries and archives. And we've worked with charities and foundations and education establishments. 
And a lot of the principles I'm going to be talking about today are very much based on key principles relating to rights clearance that are country agnostic. In other words, I know that you're joining us from various different parts of Europe and the UK, and I will try and keep things as broad as possible so that whatever I say will be as appropriate as I can. Um, so we have about 40 minutes and um, these are the key topics I'm going to be covering in some shape or form. Um, what's important regarding copyright is actually sometimes knowing what you don't know and also knowing the right question to ask. And so I'll be helping you to develop that understanding and then also some really good places you can go to get some of the answers. Now, the way that we're doing today, as Masha has said, is I'll be doing the presentation first and then there'll be about 10, 15 minutes for questions. So please keep them coming already now in the chat box or the Q&A box and we'll try and do as many as we can at the end of, the, of today's webinar. So um, you don't need any reminding, but we're in a content rich rich world where content is absolutely everywhere that we look and if we want to get a, some kind of handle in terms of copyright regarding what we can do and what we can't do with content that perhaps form part of our collections or maybe the um, works that we are borrowing to support our exhibitions or content that we're finding out there, we need to understand some key principles about how copyright works in an international context. And unfortunately, although we have this amazing international publishing platform that's the internet and even more so um, all the wonderful things that Europeana supports and all the work that Europeana is doing to kind of aggregate content and topics together, we have to understand that unfortunately, copyright laws are country specific. So really and truly what it boils down to is what's okay to do in one country may not be okay to do in another. So it's where the users are based. So this creates a number of complexities for us as cultural heritage organisations and certainly increases the imperative of understanding that if we can truly rely on our users being able to benefit from the wonders of our collection, we have to go and make it easy for them to do so. And so again, going back to the key points that Ariadna and Masha were making at the beginning, this is why seeking permission when you've got third party rights in the content that you're wanting to make available through whatever platform you wish is absolutely fundamental in opening up collections. So if you want any more convincing as to why copyright is important, let's just remind ourselves of the richness and the wealth of activities that take place in our cultural heritage institutions on a day-to-day -day basis. We are acquiring staff and we're borrowing staff and we're lending it out and some of us have materials deposited with us and sometimes we're commissioning people to create stuff for us creating our own stuff we're going to be sharing it with other people and that's going to involve lots and lots of different people that will be staff and volunteers and it'll also be contractors and we'll talk more about that as we go through but what we have to understand is that when we use stuff that other people have created that's non-staff we need to be certain that we're dealing appropriately with the legal and also the ethical aspects associated with that work. We have to understand that seeking permission is absolutely essential. And this is whatever legislation we're operating under. This is outlined in our mutual copyright laws, but also will be reflected in our industry standards. Now, if you thought that was hard enough, we also have to remember that sometimes copyright's not the only issue that we have to remember to deal with. We also have to remember other people's rights, data privacy rights. And so those of you that have been quaking in your shoes since GDPR came in will also be cognizant that sometimes with collection images, we're having to deal with twofold issues, copyright and also privacy rights. We may have performers rights, perhaps in some of the audiovisual content that we've got. There will always be ethics and stuff. And for that, I would just say, put it out there. If you want anything to try and pick up on the relationship between copyright and ethics, just read up on the recent issue um, with UK government releasing a photograph of a ballerina that even though it was available without any restrictions, the use of it in arguably um, um, an unethical way, I think demonstrates that often we are dealing with issues that don't just have legal compliance issues associated with them, but also there is a strong kind of ethical component to some of our collection items. Now, as I said, 
we have a short amount of time to talk, for me to present to you quite a lot of stuff. So I know that in this slide, there's loads of stuff to unpick, loads of legal issues. And here I would certainly say, start looking around at some great websites for more about copyright, more about these other issues. And I will present some of those sites you can go to at the end of this webinar. And certainly you can also jump to Europeana and find out more about these issues in more detail. But today I'm going to focus not just on what these issues are, but how do we deal with it? What's the process that we follow, we need to follow to get our collections online? Okay, well, whatever which way we look at it, um, there are lots and lots of reasons why these processes are important because there's so much going on across our organizations. And I started earlier picking up on the different types of people involved in content creation and acquisition and use. But let's just remind ourselves that there's often multiple layers of different types of copyright in our collection items. And certainly these items are being used in lots and lots of different ways. Now, in essence, the key first principle to remember is that the more types of content you have, the more layers in any piece of content, particularly more sort of complex items like audio visual recordings or perhaps born digital material, the greater the likelihood of layers of rights. The more layers of rights, the greater the likelihood is that you've got more than one rights holder and therefore you've got more work to make sure that you deal with those rights that are associated with those collection items. So when I talk about collections, let's just reflect a little bit on what do we mean? Okay, if we wanna put them online, what are they? Well, there's a whole range of different types of collections that we will have across our cultural heritage institutions that will range from paintings and drawings, 3D sculptures, could even be 3D digitally printed sculptures. Um, we've got photographs and audio visual recordings and sound recordings. Sound recordings are a wonderful example of layers of rights because there will be rights in something that the interviewer is saying, something that the interview is, interviewee is saying in the recording itself, and then the performer's rights of those people who are, who are captured in that recording. We will have many of us published text-based works like books and journals, but also unpublished literary works that could be diaries and letters and manuscripts and notes. We mustn't forget that we may also have broadcast in our collections and newspapers. Now, I'm also struck very much by the types and the variability of collection items, things that we wouldn't even think perhaps could be protected by copyright are. And one of the examples I like to reflect on is something called trench art. And trench art, um, held by one of our clients in Peter War Museums, is a really good example of soldiers in trenches taking the ammunition shells and carving on them and bespoking them and I guess using them as, a, as something just to capture a moment in time, which let's face it is often how many collection items are created. And these are technically artistic works, for which permission would need to be sought in order to put images of these items online. So without spending weeks and weeks looking at the diversity of our collections, it's really important just to remember that there are lots of them in lots of shapes and forms with potentially lots of layers of rights. And even more so today, we're not just talking about analog, but potentially born digital collection items. I know that there are many cultural heritage institutions collecting tweets and social media posts about the impact of COVID. OK, those become part of our collections. Plus, we also have to remember if we're wanting to put things online, that perhaps we have temporary items. It could be something that's commissioned for a particular purpose. Um, it could even be items that we're borrowing to support our key and core activities. So now that we've looked at what might constitute a collection, and as I've said, this is just a snapshot perhaps of the full range of items that you have, let's just reflect a little bit more on who might have created them. Now, if you look at the list in front of you, um, really and truly the only surefire way to use an item in your collection is if a member of staff has created it as part of their job, okay? Everybody else that I've listed, artists and craftspeople, freelancers and contractors, private individuals, companies, volunteer students and interns, that's when we need to think about understanding that if they've created something that's, that 
they're not doing as or they're not members of staff, we need to seek the appropriate permission from them to put these items online. Because putting an item online, if it's in copyright, needs permission. This is a restricted act under any of your legislative frameworks. Now, there is also um, the situation, and this is often uh, more common, I think, than we give credit to, where we actually don't know where an item um, has, to, who's created it or how it's arisen. And there will be many of those items in your collections. I'm not talking necessarily about orphan works here. And I think this is interesting and there is a difference. Orphan works are works in copyright where we don't know who the rights holder is or we can't trace them. In this case, in the list in front of you, I'm talking about where we don't even know who the creator was. And there is a nuanced difference between the two. So I'm going to try and unpick some of the key issues associated with putting your collections online by um, illustrating situations through a couple of case studies. So here we have um, a CHI, Cultural Heritage in in Institution, that has a splendid collection of fashion-related artworks created from the 1760s until the present day. It wishes to publish them on the internet. Some of the items are either still alive or died less than 70 years ago. And in these cases, permission needs to be sought before the images can be published. So this is a classic situation that you may find yourselves in. For any of the items where the artists have died more than 70 years ago, those will be out of copyright. But if the artist is still alive or um, has been dead for less than 70 years, this is where the permission is required. So what are some key points about that particular case study um, that will move us forward? Well, certainly, if any of the items are your copyright, your organization's copyright, so let's just reflect a little bit on what I said before, perhaps created by a member of staff or maybe where you've commissioned someone to create works for you and you have in writing a transfer of copyright over to your organization, um, those are fine to put online. Any items that are out of copyright. So again, if we look at the date threshold that have been created more, um, that have been created um, by somebody who's been dead for more than 70 years ago, those will be fine. Um, or the third category will be where you have permission already. Okay, so those will be fine to put online. What we're going to be looking at is where you don't have permission or you haven't got enough permission. And we certainly know in those cases that that will be therefore the uh, impetus for seeking permission from the rights holder. Um, and also where there are question marks or where these works are in copyright where we can't trace the rights holders or sometimes, as I already highlighted, we may not even know if the work is in copyright. So what are some top tips to deal with these? Well, there's an awful lot to say about this. And certainly if you are um, a museum, you could look to the rights procedure outlined in Spectrum, which is a collections management standard. If you're an archive or if your library is looking across at um, industry standards. But the most important point when trying to put your collections online and has also been alluded to by Masha, which is giving yourselves time, making sure you build this into your project, making sure that you take time to identify or to try and identify who the rights holders are. And this is not as easy as it sounds. It often requires a lot of effort in trying internet searches, looking through old um, organizational records, trying to find out if you can identify the rights holder. Now here, um, to help you on the Naomi Korn website um, in the resources section, you can find a checklist which we have put together to help you to understand where you might go to to try and trace rights holders. So of course, as well as doing a general internet search, there is um, an online database called the Watch File, writers and artists and their copyright holders. You might want to go to your uh, country's collecting society for artists um, and photographers. In the UK, there's the Design and Artist Copyright Society. Um, in Germany, it's Bildkunst. In France, it's ADAGP. And all these collecting societies have um, reciprocal arrangements. So you go through your own country's collecting society and then you have access to all the artists represented by the sister societies all over the world. So you can do that. And we've listed a number of other steps. Now, crucially, when you have found the rights holder, and I'm going to talk a little bit about when you haven't, but in this case, if you have found the rights holder, it's absolutely fundamental to get permission in writing. 
is important because you need to be clear about what you're asking for and you also need to communicate carefully to the rights holder about what you're asking them to give you so that they also can understand what your requirements are. Now here, Ariadna mentioned earlier about making sure that if you are releasing your images under a Creative Commons license, um, then you need to be clear with the rights holders that you are doing so, that you wish for permission from them to do that, but also to specify the Creative Commons license you're looking to release images of those artworks out under. That's absolutely fundamental and previous um, webinars, and I know the, the other webinars in the Europeana series will be unpicking Creative Commons licenses in more detail, but it's absolutely fundamental that you um, ask for those permissions in writing and specify what you need. Make it easy for someone to say yes. And again, here, it's like any legal compliance issue. It's about understanding how you would feel if you were that person. Um, so if you were the rights holder and you were to receive a letter from someone, um, perhaps not being very clear about what they wanted, you will probably be less likely to give them permission for what they want. And so reflect on that. And when you're approaching someone for permission to put images of collection items online, tell them what you want to do, tell them about your project, um, enthuse them about what you're doing, um, tell them the benefits of your project, tell them about your organisation. They may not have heard of you, explain who you are and what you do. And it's about convincing them, making it easy to understand the language that you use, um, don't make any assumptions about their level of literacy. So use simple to understand language. Um, communicate clearly, use bullet points. Um, be clear, perhaps, about when you would like them to answer you by. Now, that doesn't mean that if they don't answer you by that point, you have authorization to put uh, their collections online or their works online, but it gives them a guide as to when, when to get back to you. Now, I remember in the days of sending letters to people in the post, maybe we still do that a bit, right? Um, I mean, I now know, you know, now we do things by email, but sometimes people um, don't assume that everyone has an email address, but, but whatever you use, whether you're posting someone a permissions form or you're sending them an email, make it easy for them to say yes. Tell them how you want them to say yes. So if you're posting them a letter, um, send together with the letter you're posting them a stamped addressed envelope so that they can sign the form and pop it in the post back to you or give them an email address that they can write to or tell them if you if you even want to that they could sign a form and take a photograph of the form that they've signed and upload that and attach that to the email to send back to you don't assume any whilst not assuming any levels of perhaps general literacy don't assume any levels of digital literacy either so um, again, to try and kind of move you forward to uh, seeking permission to put items online, um, we have created a template rights clearance form, which you can download from our resources page on our website. Um, it's available under a Creative Commons license for you to be able to bespoke and make appropriate for your own purposes. Um, our rights clearance form um, contains two options, either for the rights holder to transfer copyright or indeed to give permissions um, through tick boxes. In our experience, so this is of a, a many, many years working with rights holders, we have found greater success if we ask for specific purposes in specific tick boxes so that rights holders have the options of saying yes or no to certain uses rather than bundle all the required uses together. If you bundle all the required uses you want to make of a work together, we have found that there's a greater chance that the rights holder, if they don't like one of the things you're asking for, will not let you have anything. If you want to put something up on a social media site, you will need to ask permission for this as well. Now, our form, we hope, will provide you with a really good start point, plus a really good basis if you have a collections management system to reflect the permissions that you've been granted straight through into the same fields replicated in your collections management system. Because here, I want you to remember that the permissions that you secure to put items online is a process that will have benefits in longevity for your organization. Therefore, you need to make sure that 
the information you capture in your permissions field is reflected in your collections management systems so that you can access that information forever, you and anyone else. It's centralized and stored also on systems, ideally, where the information is accessible and searchable and retrievable. And there's a whole load of stuff I could tell you about the benefits of having structured data or structured data fields on your collections management system rather than free text fields so that you are able to structure rights management information appropriately for the long term. Okay, second case study, and these are just a snapshot again of some of the issues, but hopefully will give you a bit of a kickstart in collect getting your collections online. In this case, a dance company has commissioned various photographers to take photographs of its dancers from the 1950s to the 1990s. There was no discussion about copyright and the photographers and their rights holders still own the copyright. Many of the rights holders are either unknown or cannot now be traced and we call these orphan works. Now, this is a real example for us, and I think there are many lessons here to be learnt. Um, certainly, um, before we even unpick in a bit more detail issues surrounding orphan works, I do want to say that when you do commission uh, people to create content, digital content um, or whatever for your CHI, it's really important to deal with copyright in any contracting agreement. It's really important to be clear about what you are paying for and then how you can then use the works that are created. If you are mute, if you don't say anything, um, then it's very likely, depending upon your legislative framework, the laws you have in place, that you won't have free use of those works. Certainly in the UK, I know that if we commission works to be created on our behalf, we must say something about copyright in the contractual agreement to ensure we can then use the works. Now, there, there is a piece of work that my company's just completed for the UK's National Lottery Heritage Fund, looking at the copyright issues when working with suppliers. There was a free webinar that um, I ran a few weeks ago, and there is the link to the website um, where you can watch this one. Um, but there is also a guide, I think, that will be published this week, which will explain all this information in more detail. The guide itself is available under Creative Commons Attribution Licence, and you can get to it from the link I'm going to present to you at the end. So that does deal with the issue associated, associated with copyright and suppliers. Okay, so let's look in a bit more detail at Orphan Works. Um, okay, so dealing with Orphan Works, um, absolutely fundamental, and we started looking at this before. It's about documenting the attempts you make to try and trace rights holders. It's about recording this information. Um, it's about keeping this information. It's important in order to demonstrate that you have seriously done everything you can to try and trace the rights holders. Um, but I would also say too, that this is a really good example of um, an organization understanding that spending days and days to try and trace rights holders is probably disproportionate to the, to the real level of risk and certainly the resources you probably have available. So please um, be proportionate about the searches that you're making and um, try and think sensibly about um, perhaps fixing the number of attempts you make as an organization to try and trace rights holders that reflects both your organization's appetite for risk, but also um, the type of work that you're using and the, and the way in which you're using it. But no matter what, no matter how many attempts you do make, documenting these attempts is important and storing information about the attempts you make to try and trace rights holders on your collections management system or some kind of system, even an Excel spreadsheet that's held centrally on a central drive is absolutely fundamental as part of any further use you then make of Orphan Works. Okay, um, so we spoke about documenting it, we've spoken about recording attempt, uh, attempts on your collections management system or similar. The next step will be to assess the risk. Now, um, there are different um, kind of outputs here. Um, assessing the risk is important and is certainly mitigated substantially if you can use the EU's orphan works exception. And this um, was brought into the legislative frameworks across Europe back in 2014. The difficulty with the EU orphan works exception is that it only relates to either text-based works and audio-visual works or embedded visual works that sit in these. It doesn't 
in any shape or form relate to freestanding artistic works. It doesn't cover the use of photographs or artistic works like sculptures or paintings. And this is a problem because it means that whilst there are other types of works that can be used under the EU orphan works exception, but those freestanding artistic works that actually many of the organizations we have worked with over the years have found to be the, the greatest or the likeliest candidates to be orphan works, they aren't covered by that exception. So we need to look to other ways of managing these. And these would be either on a risk managed basis, and therefore it would be about trying to understand the nature of what you're using and the way in which you're using it and to come up with a, if you like, um, almost a protocol. And I would say that the more perhaps something was made as a commercial endeavor in the first place, so this could be photographs taken or held by photographic agencies, the greater the risk. Or perhaps if it was um, a piece of audio visual content like a film whereby um, it was made maybe by a film studio that you can't find them anymore or you can't find the rights holders. Again, that would be higher risk than say um, a snapshot that someone took standing on the street or um, sort of a, a, an interesting orphan work that I found um, fairly recently was of a group of uh, First World War nurses standing under a tree. Okay, now I would say that that particular example is a really good example of perhaps very, very low risk because the photographer probably doesn't remember that they took it. The photographer is probably dead and any rights holders probably don't even know um, that they're the rights holders of that image. So I, can't, I think here this is about trying to understand risk through the um, kind of perspective of uh, type of work and type of use and the context in which it was created. Now, of course, if you come across works or orphan works, you can't trace the rights holders and they're unknown. You carried out your diligent attempts and perhaps you've evaluated that the risk is too high. Your next option is not to use them. And it's as simple as that. And I have to say, again, in my experience, um, there are very few items that cultural heritage organizations haven't used um, as orphan works. And in fact, the most likely outcome of having orphan works that perhaps present higher risks is to restrict the onward use license. Okay, that's the most likely output of or outcome of finding those types of works. But certainly um, a way also to mitigate any risk apart from documenting your attempts and evaluating the risk associated with orphan works is to have a robust notice and takedown policy and procedures. And this simply means that if something goes wrong, if someone comes out of the woodwork, if someone comes forward and says, oi, this is my work, um, you have a way of making it better. You can also apologize. You can take something down if you verify that they are the rights holder. And so building this into organizational process, making sure that your digitization teams and um, your staff and volunteers understand that perhaps if they're notified um, by the rights holder or they get to hear, they know they need to talk to somebody in your organization who can deal with it. And that's part of your notice and takedown policy and procedures. So um, lots to tell you, right? And you can see there's lots here and I've tried to really sort of synthesize this down for you. So picking up on multiple rights in any one item, giving yourselves time. What else can I tell you? Um, so you can kind of hit the ground running with your rights clearance work and understand how that relates to um, trying to be part of the sort of online European cultural heritage. Well, I can't say it enough. You must give yourselves time, okay? If you leave rights clearance to the end, you'll run out of time or you'll end up losing the ability, if you do come across rights holders, to negotiate a fair price. In my experience, we have more sway in negotiation if we've got more time if we feel we're comfortable that we could even say to a right so well that's too expensive and to push back the less time we have the more likelihood we, have, we will pay higher fees if we are charged and of course we'd like to be able to do everything for free but the reality is that's not always going to be the case okay my second top tip 
building rights clearance from the start, you cannot do it early enough. And if I have my choice with all the cultural heritage organizations that we work with, I would absolutely insist all the time that rights clearance is done, not at the point of use, but at the point that you're acquiring items into your collections, at the point of acquisition, okay, or when something is being lent to you, or when it's being deposited, or at the point of commissioning. One of the problems we have as a sector is we have this huge mountain of retrospective rights clearances. What I'd say is let's kind of put a line, a line in the sand from now on let's try and deal with copyright when things enter into our collection so much easier i know that's not always the case we can't always do that but sometimes we can and so that's going to alleviate problems downstream um okay so um get permission in writing and be clear about the platform in, on which you want to make it available okay communicate that to the person once you've got hold of them um, be clear about the CC license that you, you want to make your works available under and also in your rights clearance um, attempts, make sure you understand the crediting. So again, when you're in the process of seeking permission, try and ask at that point for how the rights holder wishes to be credited so you can reflect that. Keep a record of the permissions that you've been granted so you can refer to it at a later point. Again, in our experience, um, some of the things that have gone wrong are not at the point that we're asking permission, but some years on when perhaps license agreements or emails have got lost because they've been stored in people's email inboxes and they've left an organization or that information hasn't been made accessible centrally. So no one else knows what permissions you've negotiated. So again, Wonderful, beautiful, all singing or dancing permissions you might get from rights holders are only as good as your ability to communicate these permissions to other people in your organization that might wish to want to use these images as well. Have a strategy in place for orphan works. These are massive disruptors to putting cultural heritage, um, European cultural heritage online. Um, over 11 years ago now, I, I wrote one of the first reports looking at the impact and scale of orphan works on the delivery of um, public services by our cultural heritage organizations. And at that point, I, um, on the back of a, a big survey, um, extrapolated that about 50% of any collection is likely to be an orphan work, okay? That's 50% of your collection. So you need a big old strategy to support you dealing with orphan works. It takes more time, but also I think it takes more bravery because we also need to understand that actually the reality is that putting most orphan works online is probably not going to be a problem. However, there are some really important steps that we need to follow. And yes, we still have the EU orphan works exception. It may not cover freestanding artistic works, but there are other things it does cover and we should be using it if we can. As I said earlier, don't forget other legal issues that you may come across, so performance rights, data protection. Um, we also need to be very sensitive to the nature of the items we're putting online. So even if there may not be a legal reason why we um, shouldn't put it online, there may be a strong ethical reason. And here I am minded of, say, some of the collections that some of you have that relate to wars or conflicts or people suffering. And there, even though some of that material may, may be well out of copyright, um, in our roles as custodians of these collection items, we also need to be sensible and sympathetic about how or if we put them online at all. And uh, Ariadna has already mentioned um, Europeana and the rights statements. And, and this is really where this webinar fits with all the other uh, webinars that Europeana is running um, to understand that whatever the status, it's about using the right statuses or Creative Commons licenses to communicate it. Because again, if we want our collections to be opened up, if we want people to engage with our collections in a lawful way, we need to be clear about how they can do that. We have to communicate to them. And that's what um, the work of Europeana is in part about. So some key points to remember, deal with copyright, as I said earlier, um, we talked about um, acquisition and creation and building good rights management um, into everything that you've got going on. Copyright should be integrated into what you do. And in fact, rights management means um, risk management. It means contract management. Um, and sometimes, you know, we need to also understand that we can make things easier for ourselves if we roll it into our procurement of uh, services when relating to contractors and also when we deal with volunteers. This is about training. It's about everyone in your organization being aware about their responsibilities. 
And certainly the benefits of good rights management means that, yes, we comply with the law, but we respect creators. OK, they're not the other. OK, we're not we're not polarized. We are creators as well as users. They're users and creators. It's it's a, it's a real sort of blended um, relationship that we have with copyright. And of course, the better we deal with rights management and the more access we get, but also it's about increasing our visibility, our efficiency and reducing costs. If we don't do copyright right and we leave it to the end or we don't think about it as part of the processes we have, that will reduce the opportunities for public access um, and also potentially damage reputation. Um, and I would say in the long tail, actually stifle innovation and creativity because we're not either ourselves being able to engage with our collection items in the way that we, re we really could if we deal with rights to management appropriately, and other people's, our users, thinking about our users of our website and all the wonderful benefits when we put our collection items online. So, as I said, I wanted to give you about 15 minutes for questions. Um, I wanted to just give you a few dates for your diary. So um, there's lots of stuff that we do. Um, there are um, a little sort of snapshot of some of the um, training that we're running as a company, um, our basic copyright essentials course. We've got a special session we're running for the first time um, for artists. And we're also doing um, a session on finding and using Creative Commons licensed resources, particularly for people building online um, resources or um, perhaps converting face-to-face -face training into online training. Places you can go to to find out more. Um, I mentioned our website and our resources, but there is a really brilliant website called Copyright User um, that has provided loads of information about copyright and how that works. I'm a great fan of the work that they do. They've got lots of videos and interactives, and it's ever such a useful way of communicating what is a complex subject in a way that's accessible. Um, I've given you a link to charity, um, our heritage digital site which contains um, loads of information about um, copyright and also it's part of the consortium that Nemecon Associates is um, party to funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund. A few publications for you and then finally if you are interested um, the report I wrote all the way back in 2009 doesn't time fly looking at orphan works um, you can download that report here. So um, I hope I've given you some tips. I hope I've given you um, a great awareness of some of the issues to be mindful of when you're putting collections online. But now I'd like to invite you to ask me questions and let's see how much more value I can add to um, the session that we have together. Um, Masha, I think, are you going to be hosting the questions for me? Yeah, thanks Naomi for this. So we already have two questions. And the first one is about rightstatement.org. So I'm just going to give a bit of context for those who might not be so familiar with them. So rightstatement.org is a project and they were created uh, to be used by cultural heritage institutions and aggregators. They are not licenses like Creative Commons licenses, but they work as descriptions, a good faith descriptions of copyright status of the object. And the question we have is about one of those right statements, which is uh, copyright not evaluated. This is a right statement that is used when organization didn't put any effort or didn't even try to find out what the copyright status of the item is, but is making that item available online anyway. So the question we have is, what is the legal ground and what are the consequences of using this right statement? So I'm guessing this is also a question about risk managed approach, right? You haven't done any clearing of the rights, but you're making something available online. So what's your perspective on this, Naomi? Um, I think it's difficult. I mean, um, putting something on, the bottom line is putting something online without seeking permission is um a bit of a problem because it's not it, it doesn't it, it won't act as a kind of get out of jail card free it's simply that you just haven't sought permission and i would say that your risk is quite high if you do that and certainly you're not complying with the legal requirements um, that we all have in terms of putting items online and particularly if you then relicense it out under a creative commons license you then provide the means for other people um, to use this in an infringing way. And I think this is another reason why 
rights clearance is really important because if we want our stuff to be used by others under open licenses, we have to do the hard work for them. We have to clear rights for them to be able to reuse the works under the specific Creative Commons license we choose. So putting statements on to say copyright not evaluated in my book isn't really good enough. Right. I don't think that it's it's not legally compliant. And I also would say, too, that it's not it's not it doesn't respect creators. And I think this is I think this is a really sort of fundamental part of what a cultural heritage organization should do, which is balance um, users with the creators that it works with and it represents and the works that it's the custodians of. Yeah, at Europeana, we certainly try to discourage providers from using this right statement. Mm. Uh, and it should be seen as a statement of the last resort. But I think what it comes down is also to um, decisions that each institution needs to make. Uh, what are the risks that you are willing to take? You know, before using a right statement like this, you really should be evaluating the risks, looking at the digital object, how likely it is that you're going to damage your reputation and also violating uh, copyright owner's rights. I mean, I think that's right. I mean, I, I do, I, I, I would stress again, um, I'm behind me here. Okay. This is a painting by my mother. So my mother's an artist. I come, my, my family are artists. I come from, you know, painters and sculptors and musicians. And I am acutely aware of straddling as a, as a, as a company, but also as, as sort of as part of the cultural heritage sector, straddling that relationship between creators and users and us as custodians. And, you know, we just, I think that it, I agree with you, yes, ultimately it's down to risk, but not doing copyright at all, or just using that statement without having even sought permission um, is, is, is legally um, problematic. But also, as I said, it's, it's, it, it's, it undermines our position as cultural heritage organizations, as trusted organizations, as the guardians of these important works. And let's face it, many cultural heritage organizations are still working with living artists. It's about reassuring them that we look after their works and we look after, we're respectful of their copyright. So I think, I do feel that it's, it's a bigger conversation, a bigger issue, a more complex issue than um, whether it's okay to use that statement or not. It brings very much into the for our very position as a cultural heritage organization. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so we have a few more questions. Uh, the next one is about orphan works. Um, and the question is, uh, if we have an orphan work, does this work first have to be registered in the uh, EU IPO orphan works database? So this is also related to the orphan works provision. And then there's another uh, question about, um, well, related to orphan works. And this is about whether we can recommend a good workflow to evaluate the copyright status. Okay, so um, I'm just going to get something. Um, so there is um, the orphan works, um, the EU orphan works database, yes, you, um, is a requirement before you use an orphan work. So absolutely correct. Um, you, some of you can input the information directly onto um, the orphan works um, database, the EU Orphan Works database, and some of you, so depending upon which country you're based in, may have to go through um, your equivalent of a copyright office. It depends on how it's set up in your own country. Um, the, um, in order to um, register your work as an orphan work on the EU IPO Orphan Works database, you need to carry out your own searches, reasonable searches for rights holders. And then you need to feel yourselves that you have done enough. So it's kind of a lot on you. And then if you um, have registered that work on the EU or from Works database, if a rights holder does come forward um, and um, I guess you're satisfied that you've done enough to try and trace the rights holders, you can either take that work down or you can have a conversation with them about what happens next. But your use up to that point um, will be covered effectively um, as an insurance if the rights holder comes forward. So yes, um, Cita, thank you very much indeed for that question. Um, just to say that if the UK leaves the EU without a deal, which we don't know yet, 
For those of you from the UK, we will immediately lose access to the um, EU IPO OrphanWorks database. So we can't use the OrphanWorks exception the minute we leave the EU without a deal. And that's already, there's already been legislation written. For those of you in the UK, if you are interested in that, please drop me an email um, or keep in touch with me separately and I can talk to you more about the impact of that. Regarding workflows, I'm just looking at my shelves actually. I did do some work um, the best thing I can recommend, here we go. So I don't know if you can see this, is my video still on? Um, this is a book I wrote in 2015 with Collections Trust, Gordon McKenna from Collections Trust, A Practical Guide to Copyright, which I think you still can get copies of. And in there, you'll be pleased to know that there are workflows um, relating to orphan works. Um, I'm trying to see if I've got one here. Um, yeah, there are, loads of, there are loads of workflows you can gain hold of. Um, this is actually just an example. It's not the one I'm looking for, but it just gives you an idea. So there are some workflows in this publication um, and there are a checklist on our website. But as time goes on, I will try and make more stuff available under a Creative Commons license. I don't know if anyone else knows of any other orphan works work, workflows. I think BFI, um, Annabelle Shaw has done quite a lot of work on orphan works. Fred Saunderson at the National Library of Scotland has done some. I'll be doing some as well fairly soon too. So there will be more, more stuff coming out about orphan works and workflows for you to gain access to. Okay, um, thanks. We have a lot more questions. A quick one about permissions. Is it acceptable to ask uh, permission for all future, but as yet unknown uses? Uh, <laughs> um, not really. Um, I, it, it's totally acceptable to build into your permissions form retrospective rights clearances for anything you've done before and anything you want to do in the future, you can do that. And you can also get an assignment of rights backward, current and forward in works you may acquire where from the person who, um, if they're the rights holder, but not being specific about uses is a problem and could be questioned. And I think could, I, I think it's a problem both in terms of, again, legalities. And um, we have got some case law suddenly in the UK called the Tassini case, which really the outcome of that is you've got to be clear about what you're asking for. But second of all, I'd say ethically too, right? You know, let's be transparent with rights holders. They're not the other. You know, we're rights holders too. Let's communicate with rights holders how we would wish to be communicated with and asked. You know, the more transparency, the greater the trust, the more we're likely to be able to do what we want with other people's stuff because they've given us the permission to do so. So I think that, you know, for all those reasons, my answer is no. It's not okay. Okay. Now I'm going to jump to the question by Mia, and I hope others don't mind, but this question is actually very, very relevant for Europeana. And her question is, do you know a good way to communicate with smaller CHIs who wish to protect their digital content, even if it's out of copyright? So this is something we discuss a lot, this balance between licensing, trying to make money out of your collections, um, and what to do in the case when physical objects are uh, out of copyright. I think Europeana's position is quite clear on that. We are asking um, CHIs to really protect the public domain and then clearly mark digital objects as being out of copyright. But Naomi, if you want to add something, feel free. Um, yes, I mean, I've, I've um, look, I, I, I'm a great believer in um, kind of having everything you want and um, making everything possible. And I do think that there is, um, I, I, I think that it is possible to make images available under um, Creative Commons licenses um, at the same time and also making money. Um, and it's really about a bigger issue here about business models and where the value is. And um, looking at how you can present an enhanced model so that you can, both present images available for free, but the CHI can make money also. And that can be through um, maybe selective release of Im certain images, um, ones that perhaps are not the best sellers under Creative Commons licenses and maybe more restrictive, maybe NC and ND restricted Creative Commons licensed access to images that perhaps have greater value for you. It could also be about providing um, a range of products as well as the images so that the images act as viral marketing effectively for the products. So the products you could also make available maybe through an online shop. 
Um, I think it's about um, thinking about your users and, you know, also the if you give something to your users for free, thinking about the user journey to you, whether it's to your website or through a physical premises and maybe even the use of um, perhaps donation boxes and asking for donations. So I think there's a blended approach. I know that, um, and it's difficult for me because I know that my UK based colleagues, and we were talking about this before this webinar, um, the UK cultural heritage sector is, is in a really bad way. And, um, you know, the, the money that is made through image licensing is an important source of income. And I would never, um, never suggest that that should be taken away from them. So um, I think that this is a complicated issue, but it should be looked at through the lens of business models, our value of customer journey, of user benefits, of um, the money that a cultural heritage organisation needs to stay afloat. Um, it should also be looked at through the lens of clearance of third party rights and costs and the costs that cultural heritage organisations incur. Um, what does it mean to be a cultural heritage organisation? What does it mean like access? So, you know, in the UK, our national museums are open for free. Anyone can come to them for free. In Europe, that's not the case necessarily. Um, but at the same time, in the UK, we charge for access to images. Whereas in Europe, I think there are more cultural heritage organisations that make their images available for free. And so all these things in the round and how we're funded, I think it's a complicated issue. Well, that's it's point. already, yeah, thanks. It's already three o'clock, but uh, Naomi, if it's okay with you, can we take one last question? Yeah. Uh, question I'm one, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, this one is really interesting, and it's about um, uh, copyright research and duplicating efforts between different cultural heritage institutions from different states when they're researching copyright holders. Um, GDPR prevents us the sharing of these data, but could a central institution take a responsibility for the search and ask for permission to act on behalf of individual collections? Oh, it's an interesting one. Um, possibly, I, I would say that the closest fit we probably have is the watch file. So this was set up um, as a collaboration between the University of Reading and University of Texas to try and do that. But I think that's a really good, really good question because it does show you the interface between the two different pieces of legislation. So great, yes. But if we were to do that, if someone were to do that, then absolutely there would need to be consent from all the rights holders to share that information in order to make it practical and possible. So yeah, good. I can take it, I'm happy to go on a bit more, Masha, if you if you guys want, I can I can certainly go on for another, try and get some more questions. Yeah, that's fine with me. Um, there's one uh, also interesting question. How do you approach works for which it is not clear whether they are copyrighted or not? So these are borderline cases when the author is not known, but the work is dated to circa 1925. So the author might not be dead for more than 70 years. Okay, good point. Thank you. Um, well, I, I know how I'd approach it in the UK. So in the UK, we have a proviso in our copyright legislation that if a work um, has an unknown creator, then 70 years from the date of creation, we can take that that work is out of copyright. So that's great. So a lot of the First World War stuff I've encountered we can eliminate it as not being in copyright. Um, but I would say that this um, then brings, perhaps where you can't trace the right, if you don't know who the creator is, it brings into the four issues of um, risk management. And I would say that um, perhaps there is almost a sort of, a, a, a sort of a, a more strategic approach to risk management, perhaps that we should be thinking about. So in any corpus of material, it's likely that you have um, a collection of stuff that's from different dates and so therefore probably what you could do is as an organization create a risk to manage strategy so that the older the material um, if it contains all from works the more likely you would be to release it with the less number of searches okay so the more contemporary the greater the number of searches you would try but I would treat I would treat anonymous works realistically in the same way as all from works and there's another question from Lisa about unpublished archive creators. I think Lisa is probably from UK where we have this um, law that unpublished material stays in copyright till 2039. I think this is related to this. So her question is, 
uh, about yeah attempts to trace the rights holder, which is obviously huge and uh, not always possible. And she's saying being proportionate, this seems unrealistic compared to the risk involved. What would you document as a reasonable effort in this scenario? A good point. Thanks, Lisa. I mean, I didn't want to talk about 2039 because I get very exercised and passionate talking about that. Um, I, I would say that in, in our experience, you know, I mean, look, this is this is a legal disclaimer. What I'm, I'm going to say now, this is a real insight into what we do. About five to six attempts is probably a moderate approach to risk. OK, so Lisa, you're bang on. Right. If stuff is hundreds of years old, really? Do the rights holders even know that they exist? And I know that there are some of our great and good organisations in the UK that take those works that are protected um, by copyright until the end of the year 2039 that are hundreds of years old in the same way as they would treat um, other works protected with a normal um, duration and almost treat them as lifetime plus 70 because otherwise it gets mad, it gets nuts. So I just want to give you a heads up, Lisa, that that might be an option, but that is massively disclaimed from my part as being entirely your organization's decision. If, but if that gives you some insight, then I'm pleased. Uh, yeah, thank you. I've just uh, noticed that I skipped one question from, self, uh, from Sam. Does inherited copyright have an endpoint? Yes, it does. So um, the duration of copyright normally is based on someone's lifetime. And if you're in, in the EU, plus 70 years no matter who copyright passes on to. So if it passes on from one person to another to another, it doesn't matter, it doesn't get extended. It will always be based, will generally be based on someone's lifetime plus 70 years. So it will expire. The only case I know of, well, there are only, there's only, the only way you can extend it is normally if you can change the law, but the only real case I know of in the UK where that, other than 2039 candidates, is um, for those of you that have heard of J.M. Barry, who is the author of the Peter Pan books, it's a really lovely story that Jim Barry is now to copyright and he had a great, um, he was a, a real supporter of a great Ormond Street um, hospital for children. And when he died and when he passed, his, his works passed out of copyright, his estate lobbied parliament. And what the UK's Copyright Designs and Patents Act has is at the back an annex that states that even though Jim Barry is out of copyright, any performances of Peter Pan, the royalties in perpetuity, which means forever, will go to Great Ormond Street Hospital. And I think that's brilliant. Like, that makes me extremely happy. But that just shows you um, that it requires a special provision in legislation in order effectively to, to create extended copyright. And just quickly, um, if you do have um, a work that's created by a company or company-owned copyright, that's not in, in, in perpetuity either. That will be based, the duration of copyright will be based on either the employee's lifetime plus 70 years, if you know who they are, or 70 years from creation if you don't. Okay, so there is a cutoff point there as well. Okay. Uh, we also have some questions in the chat, but we won't have time for that. So I'm just going to wrap up with this last question from the Q&A uh, box. And it's about um, collaboratively funded research projects. Shannon is asking, are we allowed to ask for permission to use objects for collaboratively funded research projects slash creative commons? Um, I'm not completely sure if I um, understand. <laughs> I understand. Um, I, I, from what I understand, Shannon, thank you for the question. Um, I think it will depend upon what the funder has asked. Okay, so what is the funder? What's in the funder's agreement? Okay, that for me will be the answer. So I can't give you a yes or no, but I would strongly recommend that if you have something that's perhaps funded by um, a government funding body or um, in the UK Research Council or National Lottery Heritage Fund or Arts Council or whoever and in Europe you'll have your equivalents. If you're not sure about what you can do with the deliverables from that funded research, check the funding agreement because there should be something there. If it's mute about copyright or IP in a way that's brilliant for you because you probably can do with it as you wish depending upon other factors, but many of them will now include specific clauses and those will determine what you can or can't do with that research or that work that they funded. Okay, so I hope that answers that okay. question. 
Okay, so I think this is a wrap. Ariadna, would you like to um, uh, like us to answer any more questions from the chat, or you think this is it and we can call it an end? Uh, whatever you prefer. Yeah. Okay, then I would just like to thank you, Naomi. This has been really great, and I hope it's been also useful for all the attendees. So thank you. Uh, for uh, participating in this webinar. We're going to share the recording and all the slides with everyone. So thank you and see you in November when we have a new webinar about open access. Thanks everyone. Thanks for joining us. And thank you guys. Thanks Naomi. Pleasure. Bye everyone. Bye. -bye. Bye.